My name is Sister Mary Luke Tobin. I'm a Catholic sister. I belong to the order of the Sisters of Loretto. And we were founded here in the United States, and that makes our order rather interesting. We don't have any European connections, if you want to put it that way. We went out on the frontier when uh, Americans needed, American Catholics needed schools for their children, and there were none. And so when the three young women went across the Appalachians and started to uh, educate the children of the families they went across the mountains with, uh, one of these young women said, let's form a religious community. So we consider ourselves very American, American or originated, and uh, it's, it has been the history of our order. I entered the order uh, when I was 19, and I entered it in uh, 1927. And uh, I have had a long life in the order, a very rich and happy life, because the work I was doing was principally as the Christian faith suggests, that it be for others. And so it was, for my, as far as I'm concerned, it was a good choice. I've always been happy in the order, and I'm very glad that I chose not only this order, but that I chose religious life. It's not for everybody, and I understand it, but it's for some. And I feel there's an important place in the church for those who prefer it, want it, and uh, would like to do their part as uh, Christians, as Catholics uh, particularly, uh, in this way. I've always been a teacher, uh, and most of my life has been in that, spent in that way. When I came to the point of deciding more seriously what I was going to do with my life, I was largely attracted by, I guess, what I could call, and I will call it this, um, the, um, the attraction to God. Now, when I say that, I mean that there was something very um, urgent and rich and attractive in the idea of a life for God. And it appealed to me highly. And even though I was just out of high school, I thought, and I spent two more years in college, but I didn't ever change my mind. The appeal and the attraction of this life was very strong in me, and it never wavered. And I still feel attracted by the same thing. There are many ways to live one's life for God, of course, but this had a particular attraction for me, and nothing else would have supplied for that attraction. Uh, and so that's why I entered it, and I chose an order. Didn't make a lot of difference at that time which kind of order, but that was the attraction. And so I fulfilled it, and I have, I have been happy in it, and I can, you know, speak for it and stand up for it uh, and uh, be grateful that it did turn out to be my way of life. When I look back to uh, life in those early days, it was very strict and very rigid. I remember my mother saying to me, are you sure you want to go into that? And I said, yes, I'm sure I want to go into that. She said, I know an order of nuns, and they had to clean 100 oil lamps every single day. Well, I didn't even know what an oil lamp was as far as that's concerned. Didn't bother me. <laughs> I, I told her I didn't care. I'd clean the oil lamps. Somebody would teach me how to do it and so on. But and on the other hand, I want to suggest that uh, life was uh, strict in the sense of you had a job to do, and we all were in it, and we all had to learn how to do it. And there wasn't any room for those that wanted to get out of it. You were in it. And so I would say that was the reason for the strictness. It wasn't strictness for the sake of strictness. But it was strictness for the sake of the job we had to do. And there were children to teach, and there was a community to serve, and meals to fix. All of that was part of it all. But uh, it also had many opportunities for the attraction that was in me, for the attraction to God, as I call it. That there was a <clears throat> life of prayer, and that there were retreats, that there were uh, good offerings. I, I have always been a great reader, 
and uh, to read some of the best things that were coming out was always, for me, most enjoyable. And so I can say that part of it was there, even though the stricter things about living in community and really giving yourself totally were also there. As the years went on, it became less necessary to have that kind of regimentation. So we had to learn to make an adjustment to another kind of way of living that was more in conformity with, I would say, our emerging education. We all got an A-B degree in the beginning. We were teachers. And more and more of us began to get masters. More and more of us began to go on to graduate education. And so this also helped change your lifestyle. And you began to, uh, began to uh, wonder why some of the practices had less meaning than they used to have. And so I would say we were ready for Vatican II. The changes in relig religious life that came about as a result of Vatican II were necessary in my mind. I was uh, um, invited to be an auditor at Vatican II which meant that I was one of the few women invited there. And when I went to Rome, and when I went there in 1964, Vatican II was underway. Some brave uh, bishop or cardinal had stood up and said, here we are all of us bishops making these decisions, and I find out that it's strange that only half the church is here. I've always imagined the bishops looking at each other and saying to each other, who didn't show? But as a matter of fact, what he meant was there were no women. And so it was very clear to Cardinal Sunans, who died just this past year, one of the leaders of Vatican II, meeting at which all the bishops, to which they were all invited and which most of them attended, uh, and made decisions for bringing the church up to date. A great pope, John the Twenty-Third, had said, "Let's bring the church up to date, up to the twentieth century." And so, one of the reasons, one of their tiny steps in that direction, was to invite a few women, very few of us. Uh, officially, I was the only one from the United States. Uh, before the council was over, they had invited a couple more, but a very small representation of women. So I felt it's responsible, I felt responsible for pushing the cause of women forward in the church as much as I could. And of course, that was not very much. And there were all those uh, who wanted to keep the church where it was, if not further back. But I was one of those who said, no, that's, that's not what uh, the great invitation to Vatican II is about. It's to see things in the, see the church in the present. And uh, according to the problems and the good things about the present. And so in the documents of Vatican II, I was delighted to be there and to share, not in speaking, we weren't allowed to speak, but we were allowed to be present in some of the commissions where you, uh, where you could speak. That's off the floor commissions. And some of the great insights that I received that have been very helpful in my whole life happened to me in 1964 during, during uh, Vatican II. And I'd like to mention two of those. One of those insights, I carry this around memorized by heart, but it's a statement of Vatican II. Every form of discrimination against persons, whether because of nationality, religion, race, or gender, is to be overcome and eradicated as contrary to God's intent. Now to me, that's a hallmark. It is a great sentence of Vatican II, and I proclaim it everywhere I go. Every form of discrimination against persons because of any of those things, or other things, and it mentions or other things, is to be overcome as, and eradicated, both of those, as contrary to God's intent. Now that's, to me, a message of my church to me, and therefore I have been dedicated to that ever since then, in every way I can do it within my own community and within others. And the second thing that was, now that's in a document, the statement I just gave you is formally proclaimed and voted on by the bishops. It's in a document, it is Vatican II. 
There were many other things too, but to me that's a hallmark. Another one, in the meeting of the Commission on the Church in the Modern World, I was sitting with a, another woman uh, who was uh, an auditor. She was from Australia. And uh, one of the priests who was an expert, a theologian, got up and he made a, a very intense speech on how he had to include women in the document on the Church in the Modern World. And so he had said something in the document as he was proposing it to be voted on by the bishops before it was passed. And he said something uh, very flowery and beautiful about what we owe to women. And he looked at us, and with me was sitting the Australian woman, and he said to her, Rosemary, what do you think of my statement? And she said, Per Congar, she said, you can uh, eliminate all those nice things said about women. All you need to say is what women expect is to be regarded as and treated as, therefore, full human persons in the church. That's all. To me, she has said it, and she has said it, for all I'm concerned with. So it was a great moment for me. Both of those statements were crystal clear as the bringing the church into the 20th century. And be, so therefore I felt that if those two things alone could be promulgated by me in any of the teaching and talking about it that I would do, I would have done, done my service and I would have responded well to the invitation of Vatican II. The reason I was selected to uh, represent, and of course this is only in a token way, uh, one among so many, but the reason I was selected was that that very year I had been elected uh, president of the Sisters Association in the United States. Now there's a Catholic Sisters Association, therefore church-related, and uh, that year they had, in the election of officers, I was elected president. So it was normal. I mean, it was a quite natural thing that they would then invite me to uh, be the one to get to go to Vatican II. And uh, so I would say that that came sort of as in the natural course of events of my being president that year, and no, for no other reason. And so I was delighted to um, be in that capacity at that time because of the opportunities I saw, not only for women, which were so badly needed, but also uh, for sisters and their having a part in the decisions that controlled their lives. And so I, I welcomed it uh, basically for those two reasons. I was representing women, religious women in this case, sisters in this case, and I was representing them by being so chosen. And I was glad of that because I knew where they stood on many, many issues and I was glad to be able to, uh, to have that part in the whole thing. I can give you a couple of examples of uh, how was it. We were not going to be a deciding voice anyway and we knew that. However, we were involved and you know you couldn't sit and listen to those talks day after day without picking out, you know, your heroes and your anti-heroes as they came to the podium. And so we had them and we wanted certain ones to win and so forth. So that was true. I think that uh, although we didn't have a deciding voice, we certainly knew where we stood and what we wanted. We had a chance to speak to the bishops off the floor. We had a chance to uh, say what we had to say to them in many, on many occasions. And there were meetings and uh, the fathers and brothers of Taizé, for example, invited people to their home. The Protestant observers who were there also as observers. Uh, met with us, and we met many uh, outstanding ecumenical figures, people who were interested in that whole aspect of what was going to happen to the church. And so it was a privilege to meet those people. And even today, I, I can see Douglas Steer, great Quaker uh, figure, and one who uh, was a, a very lovable person. I can see him sitting there in the Vatican arms folded, Quaker fashion, listening to every word, meeting him and his wife Dorothy off the, the uh, 
platform, as it were, and talking to him, gathering with Robert McAfee Brown, great Presbyterian observer. We have a friendship endures to this day. And to meet many of these people was itself a significance. So we had all kinds of informal opportunities uh, to uh, see where things were going to go. There is no doubt about it. There were wonderful people whom I had the privilege of meeting, largely because of Vatican II, but also because of other circumstances. Geographically, I was located about 12 miles away from the Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky. And so my opportunity to meet Thomas Merton rose partly from that reason. But also, uh, it was an undoubtedly one of the great uh, spiritual privileges, if you can call it that, of my life to have met this great man and to have had many conversations with him. Um, we met through a mutual friend who was a doctor in the area, and he, uh, the doctor told me that um, if I didn't know Thomas Merton, that he could get me to meet him. And I said, that's great, never thinking it would happen. I said, he's out there behind his high walls, and he intends to stay there, and I have, I'm in charge of a great religious community, and new people coming in, and old people retiring, and so forth. How would I ever meet Thomas Merton? Well, said he, I can get you to do it. And within a week, I had a letter from Thomas Merton who said he had a question. And he thought the doctor friend, mutual friend, told him that he could maybe get an answer from me. He wanted to bring his old friend, Daniel Walsh, into contact with people in the area because he was retiring. And could he come over, Daniel Walsh, and give some lectures to our young junior college students who were novices. And to decide if it would be possible for this, and it wouldn't cost us anything, to decide if it would be possible for us, uh, he, Thomas Merton, and Daniel Walsh would come over next Wednesday and we could talk about it if I were going to be home. Well, I was going to be home. <laughs> I was delighted, of course that I was going to have a chance not only to meet Merton, but to talk with him, talk about questions of mutual interest, and um, to have his old professor of philosophy to teach our young people. So that was the beginning of an absolutely uh, wonderful opportunity to talk to Merton, to ask him anything, to learn what kind of a person he was. And I found out that uh, this monk who was uh, uh, popular with all kinds of people in the United States in the 60s, um, was a charming personal human being who was uh, very um, uh, self-effacing in a way, but also very per had a lot of personal charm. And uh, so it was great to uh, meet such a person and to realize that he was true to what he was saying in his books as much as you could find out from meeting a person. And uh, I had read all his books as they were coming out, and here was my chance to ask him about them and say, can you go further? Can you say more about this or about that? Would you give a talk to our novices? Would you talk to them about prayer? Would you talk to them about religious life? Would you uh, talk to our old sisters? Would you give them a talk on your reflections on religious life or the leadership group in our community and so on? Always yes, always yes always gracious and yes, and it I, couldn't have been the most exciting thing he was going to do that day, but he did it, did it graciously, and I, it was a great privilege of my whole life. And I must say, I, I haven't found the um, leader in the spiritual life to uh, succeed him or yet to be uh, equal to him, and so I have every reason to be grateful. Well, the kind of things that were on my mind were, first of all, he had evinced his interest in those uh, areas of the religious life that were very important to me. For example, the area of prayer, of uh, contemplation, which he had begun to make a household word, and uh, of um, our relationship to God that was growing out of this new um, effort of the church to be uh, in line with the people, if you will to be uh, ready to say the people are the church. What does that mean? I wanted to hear his views on it. 
I wanted to hear his views on um, women in the church, which he did very easily and very freely. And uh, But I guess particularly, where is religious life today? What's happening to it? Can we do better with it? All this kind of thing. So it was a, it was a, a great opportunity, and I'm sure that uh, not only I myself, but the people with me, the people that worked with me, the, the uh, people who are training the novices, the novices themselves. There are several who made an impact on me. And I would say that uh, during the war years, by which I mean Vietnam, uh, I was uh, very glad. First of all, I was glad to have Merton's view, which was that we shouldn't be in the war at all. But I was also glad to have people that he introduced me to he introduced me to Dan Berrigan, brought him over, had him give a lecture. It was a privilege to know Dan, and I still think it's a privilege to know Dan, although he's older, he's not doing as much as he used to do, but a marvelous figure. Dorothy Day, I was able to show Dorothy Day a copy of a talk about that Merton gave that she wouldn't have seen otherwise. So I went over to her place in, in New York City and, and showed her that uh, because she, of course, had known Merton in his younger days before he had entered the monastery. Uh, to meet Thich Nhat Hanh, who is in great popularity today, and, and rightly so, the Buddhist monk who has uh, had so much to do with the dialogue of Buddhist Christian, but dialogue that is going on in our time. And uh, he introduced me to him. I, I met him uh, through uh, Merton, and also uh, in his own right. Thich Nhat Hanh gave a retreat a few years ago, and I was able to participate in it, six-day retreat. It's a wonderful opportunity, and now you find his books everywhere, more and more popular, and uh, solidly uh, promoting the spiritual life in a way that, uh, that we can be grateful for in this kind of uh, religious dialogue. Well, I'm a, a hopeful person to begin with. That's my temperament and my nature. And therefore, I knew it was not going to be all euphoria and that it wasn't going to happen tomorrow. I knew that. Uh, and so I was more or less prepared for uh, it's taking time. One of my mentors, besides uh, uh, mentioning Merton and uh, mentioning uh, uh, Others, I, I would say, um, a great mentor that I didn't mention was the theologian Karl Rahner, who shaped a lot of my own spiritual life. But uh, I would say I met him at the council, too. But I uh, saw this sort of long range. Another one of my mentors is Rosemary Ruther. And I consider her uh, deep uh, work and uh, protracted work on uh, women in general, women in the church also, as very vital to much of my own understanding of the issue. And uh, Rosemary has a statement that I think applies to what we're talking about here. She said, uh, it took the Christian church from its origin up until the year 1900 to come to the point where it said that slavery is always wrong. Now that's startling, but it's true. 2,000 years to come to say, out, it's wrong. Every Christian church, there's no Christian church today that would not say that, but it took 2,000 years. If that's true, then I can't but think that this further development and growth in line with being fully human which is what a Christian has to be first of all. Um, I like to quote Karl Rahner's sentence on that because I mentioned him. The chief task of every Christian, as a Christian, is to become a full human being, one, of course, with divine depths. To me, that's as good as anything you can say. And so the Christian, I firmly believe, has divine depth. So the person, the human person has divine. In his case, the full human being has divine depths, and I believe that. And Karl Rahner taught that to me well, I think. 
And so as long as that is the statement I would make, then uh, I guess I'm an optimist. I'm a, a Christian humanist optimist in a sense because I think that's where we're going, where the human race is going, albeit with many terrible obstructions along the way. But I think that's the path, and so I guess in answer to your question, it, it, uh, it will take time. It will take a long time. But I think we have a lot of evidence on both sides. We have setbacks, but we also have some kind of growing sense of what it is to be a full human being. And the whole thing that Vatican II said can be realized, must be realized, if this journey is going to take us to what we call the end time. For Christians in the Bible, the end time is the time when all tears will be wiped away, all tears will be dried, and uh, all injustice will be overcome. That's the end time. But that's uh, pretty far off, as we all know. What would be my hopes for religious life? Well, as I've said, for me it's been a very rich and fulfilling life, a life that I chose and have not been disappointed in. I don't know that I would insist that that kind of life continue. I, I think we'll be deprived, though, if we don't have anything resembling religious life. I know the life of the vows is not a popular way of looking at life, but for some it's rich and valuable. And for those some for whom it is rich and valuable, and for the others who want it to be there because it's rich and valuable, I would hate to see it disappear. And I think that uh, most Catholics, for example, would hate to see there not to be any sisters, quote, or something like that. They see a value in our way of life, and they would like to have it there. And so I would too. But uh, it can take any number of new forms. In my own order, we have now what we call co-members, and those are people who don't have vows, but who enjoy with us uh, the religious life in its various aspects. They join with us at, especially, I'd say, in our work for, for uh, justice and peace. We do lots of things that are right out there in justice and peace that many people, you know, unless they agree with us, they wouldn't go along with. A lot of the justice issues that we espouse, uh, we have publicly stated them and we stand for them and people who can join with us can also affirm them. So I think we have a lot of leadership potential for people who are not religious in case uh, that kind of appeal does not continue and might not. But for many people that I know in the church, not religious, people in church, um, they would hate to see it not be around. So I think we have enough uh, of a willingness to, um, to hang in there with that to see if we are going to have a, a greater number. I don't know. It's hard to say. But we, we are making the changes we have to make. In other words, we are introducing the idea of co-members or um, affiliate members or whatever you want to call them who are not vowed members, but who espouse so many of the things that we espouse, that they fill up our assemblies, they come to our assemblies, they stand for things we stand for. They stand, for instance, we're against the immigration policies that would keep people out of this country for no serious reason that we can see. And things like that in the justice and peace area. We stand for those things, and people who do also agree want to be affiliated with us, and they agree to taking our positions, which they do on many of these issues. Well, I couldn't agree with you more that we're very slow to get into the ecological movement, if you want to call it that. And yet, look at the great leaders. Look at Barry, for instance. Look at leaders who have, in the ecological movement who have been Catholics or even priests or who have had a position in the church of, uh, they've been highly educated, who have written about especially Barry, but others as well, Brian Swim. These people have not only written, but they have, have uh, vocalized their views on TV and so forth. And you can't get anything better than what many of them have to offer. When people hear Brian Swim has a new book or someone, something like this, 
people get it. And many of them are Catholics, and many of them are leaders, and not all, of course. And uh, yet, uh, you know, you, you're encouraged. There's a little magazine called Earthlight. I don't know if you know of it or not. It comes out of, uh, I thought it was Oregon, but I bet it's California. In any case, they wrote and asked me if I would write an article on Thomas Merton and his view of ecology. And of course, I was delighted. And I found all kinds of quotes and all kinds of things he said to promote uh, a sound ecological position and, and view and so on. So we're slow. But there's nothing against it. There's no reason it, it can't uh, pick up steam, just as it's hard for it to pick up speed anywhere. It is. It's not just in the church, but the church should be among those most eager to promote the good of the planet and uh, the good of the earth and so forth uh, because of the gift that it is, of thousands of reasons. I'm much more ecologically conscious than I used to be, uh, say five years ago even. And so I'm delighted that that's picked up. We have co-members, for instance, that are on a farm somewhat like yours in the, in the East, and, and that's the principal purpose of, of their being there is for the ecological betterment. I'd, I'd say it's one of those areas we're slow on, but uh, there's no reason that we could be in anything, any position except for it, and uh, it's part of the work ahead.